Hey everybody, it's Jason Blah here. You guys know what time it is. Time to talk about current events in the online fitness community. And a number of subscribers have aware me that Omar Isoff has made a video explaining why bodybuilders are so weak. Now, I'm going to get into that a little bit, but first, if you guys would click like down below if you enjoy these sort of videos, please do so. It will help offset the three losers who run a dislike bot every single day on my videos. And uh, let me go ahead and put on my plus five hat of speechcraft and let's talk about this. All right. Um, like I said, Omar is a mixed bag these days. Sometimes he says some really good stuff, some very insightful stuff, and sometimes he makes complete garbage videos like this. Uh, because the reality is strength levels vary massively from bodybuilder to bodybuilder. Um, and usually the determining factors with that has to do with number one, their total muscular development, Number two, how they train. Number three, how much they abuse drugs. Um, and I think it's fascinating because he actually does so much direct work with people like Greg Knuckles. And Greg Knuckles has actually done studies and looked at data and produced data and written articles explaining why heavy drug abusing bodybuilders are sometimes weaker pound for pound than strength athletes. And it has to do with the, the dosage of their drugs. That's the number one reason. All right, I, I want people to understand that. Because Omar kind of missed the bag with this. He was talking about, well, we know based upon research when we look at elite level power lifters, that total muscle mass on their body relative to their height is the biggest factor for their, for their bench press and their squat. Now, deadlift is its own beast. Like deadlift size and strength are not as correlated. It's way, way, way less correlated than these other lifts. In other words, you're more likely to see a skinny guy who can deadlift a lot uh, than you are to see a skinny guy who can squat and bench a lot. And if the skinny guy can bench a lot, he usually has no back or leg, and he's all chest. Like, he's usually got a small frame and massive pectorals and big triceps, right? That, that's why he can bench a lot. Because for those two lifts, <laughs> lean body mass is enormously correlated, and it is actually the number one factor in how much weight you can lift, again, depending upon your frame size. So again, the shorter a guy is, the less muscle he needs to move those weights. Um, but, but that's been looked at. And, and a lot of the people that Omar actually works with understand this. They understand this because they've looked at the data themselves. They've measured athletes and bodybuilders and other people. And they've determined that, yeah, they, they, it actually is true. Those two lifts are extremely dependent upon your muscle mass. So in other words, body composition is basically everything. Body composition relative to height are the, the most important factors for a power lifter on the squat and the bench press. I'm not saying other factors don't contribute, but that's your big ones. The deadlift is where you got to bridge the gap in, in regards to that because it's its own beast. It's, it's less dependent upon, upon those factors. So he, he points that out, but then he goes on to say that, you know, there's this difference in size and strength, and it's just because bodybuilders train to failure all the time, but that's why they're bigger. Again, Omar, where, where are you getting this nonsense? It's the drug abuse combined with all the sight enhancement that makes them big and be relative, <laughs> relatively weak compared to their size. Uh, because the, the sight enhancement is another big one also. I mean, and I'd say that's one of the biggest ones when people say, well, why is this bodybuilder so much weaker than this powerlifter and has a bigger upper body? And it, it's like, um, I mean, if we set the drugs aside because a lot of powerlifters abuse gear, it's the sight enhancement. It's all the oil and crap that they're shooting in their arms and delts. In other words, it's not that they're bigger in terms of muscle mass. Um, that would be like saying, hey, a fat guy has bigger arms and chest, a guy who's really fat. Well, there's no difference between a bodybuilder who might look ripped, who's got enormous amounts of fake muscle. His arms and chest are bigger because of all the shit he's put inside of them. All right, that bodybuilder with the 24-inch arms might actually only have 20-inch arms if it wasn't for all the crap in the arms that he's put in there. And it's not just synthol. That's its own separate thing. So you get into that, you get into the whole fake muscle thing. You get into the fact that a lot of that stuff hurts their leverages, right? You're, you're losing some contractile ability. You might be losing performance because of all the stuff inside the muscle that they're, they're putting into it, the scar tissue accumulation, the oil accumulation that gets encapsulated. But again, all that scar tissue all through that muscle. Um, it affects range of motion. It can affect strength. It can, it can affect performance. So when you start putting all that in them, of course, sometimes they're going to be a bit weaker than they should be because there's fake muscle and muscle that can't move as efficiently. Um, but, but that's a big factor. It's a big factor. 
And when you start looking at, at legitimately natural bodybuilders, like most natural bodybuilders that you, we know, that if they are really natural and they have a decade or more of hard training experience, they're all strong. I don't know a single exception. That's usually your dead giveaway when you start looking at really jacked naturals. Start looking at how much can they squat relative to their body weight. That's a dead indicator of whether they're legitimately natural or use conservative amounts of gear versus do they blast a ton of gear. Did they build all their musculature off of drugs with, with minimal heavy training? Um, because what it comes down to with the other stuff, as far as hypertrophy goes, training to failure is not even really a factor. What training to failure does is ensure that you get the last quality rep. Because we know that it's workload, quality reps, training stimulus, and then recovery. That's what determines your hypertrophy. And study after study has determined that rep range isn't even the determining factor. In other words, you can achieve maximum muscle growth off triples. You can achieve maximum muscle growth off 10s. You can achieve it off of 20s. So Omar said, oh, yeah, you just got to, it's the, they're training to failure all the time. And it's like, that, that's not why. If a powerlifter did the same number of quality reps with the same tension, they would stimulate the same growth. And tons of powerlifters already do limit sets with their smaller exercises. I mean, this is, this is where Omar seems to be deviating and he seems to be stuck in his own myopic world and he doesn't seem to understand. He's made multiple videos on this saying this is what power is do. This is power building. And it's like what he's calling power building is the same crap power lifters have already been doing since before he started lifting. Like if power lifters are already doing something before you ever step under a barbell the first time in your life or possibly before you were born... If it's already the norm, that's just called power lifting. You don't get to change it to power building. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, these power lifters, uh, they, it would be power building if they do a bunch of tricep extensions to failure or curls to failure or shrugs to failure. It's like, but, but power lifters have been doing that for 40 years. Were they power building back then or were they just power lifting? Um, it, it's, it gets really ridiculous with some of this because he's trying to break these things down. And again, it's because he's over there dealing with uh, the people like the Schoenfeld Circle. And a lot of them have this view that bodybuilding is volume training and that powerlifting is nothing but one to three reps. And, and the reality is that that is so different from what people really do in the real world that it's almost like Omar just reinforcing a specific stereotype. This not actually based upon reality, and he does so because he's building a larger, trendy audience of noobs who don't know any better. These noobs don't know any better. But as far as a lot of it goes, size and strength are so heavily correlated that, you know, you say, oh, I'm in this gym full of machines, and machines have their place. Look, I'll be honest with you guys. If I had someone who came to me and said, hey, I want to build my squat bench and deadlift, and they had access to a full line of nothing but hammer strength machines, and they could only do a few barbell lifts, like they, they could deadlift, they could squat, they could bench, and they didn't have access to, to anything else, I could build their squat bench and deadlift off of that. Yeah, of course we could. We could train their classic lifts heavy. They gain the neuromuscular efficiency, the technique, the specificity, and I could build everything else up off of machines if they had a wide enough variety of machines. The problem with machines is not that they don't stimulate growth, is that they're so limited, they're such a limited tool that each machine can only do one thing. That's the problem with machine training, is that it puts less muscle on you. It has less potential because it locks you into one groove. And so if you don't have 15 different machines, machines kind of become garbage. You actually need the whole damn collection to do anything. You could use these things for supplemental lifts for, for bringing up weak points and stuff and, and total hypertrophy after your big classic lifts. Of course you could. Of course you could. It'll work just fine if you have enough machines. But if you don't have a really, really high variation of machines available, that's not going to work very well. Um, because with barbells and everything, you, you do get more variation with your free weights in terms of what you can actually do with them as far as movement patterns go and muscles built. That's, that's the real advantage. It, it's the lack of variation when you go to machines. It's not the additional variation. So yeah, if someone had the you know fifteen different hammer strength machines, I I could have them do nothing but that off the, and do their their heavy work off the classic lifts, and they could get pretty big and pretty strong. 
Um, but again, it comes back over to this point of I'm getting sidetracked there that it literally has nothing to do with the training to failure part. Um, that that's just absolutely ludicrous. That's not supported by the the research. That's not supported by the anecdote of Omar's actual idea that oh yeah, the reason these power lifters are are stronger and the bodybuilders are weaker is because the bodybuilders are so fatigued from training to failure all the time and the power lifters don't train to failure. And so they get stronger by not training to failure and the bodybuilders get bigger by training to failure. It's like, Omar, that is the, the worst, most ridiculous bro science in theory I've ever heard you state. It's completely ludicrous. It's completely ludicrous. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time.